actually today I really want to share with you some fairly personal reflections um, on what it is like to be a think tanker at this particular moment in time. Um, I think the premise that I'd like to make is that we do live in dangerous times. Um, every meeting I have with wiser and more experienced people than myself confirm this. We live in dangerous times um, with reckless leadership or absent leadership. Um, and things could go wrong. And this, I, I mention this because this is part of the dilemma that I seem to be, I have as a think tanker. Um, because, of course, the debate on the future of Europe is bread and butter for people who are working in this, in this city. Um, and I'm actually torn between looking at the debate on the future of Europe in a realistic way, um, thinking about what kind of political support ideas circulating may gain, what kind of traction those ideas might have, the Juncker scenarios paper, Macron's ideas, the various ideas circulating in, among the think tanks, various proposals. Um, to what extent are they realistically achievable? What kind of political constituency could one build around these ideas? Um, and the sort of bottom line is, of many, behind many of these ideas, is that the European integration project actually needs, needs saving. That if we look beneath the rhetoric of the past six months, shall we say, so after Marine Le Pen did not win the French presidential elections, um, you know, the rhetoric has now become, this is our time, this is our moment, we need to move forward on reform. Um, uh, but the real uh, driver is the fact that the European integration project is at risk, because Marine Le Pen didn't win, but she could have, okay? So on the one hand, there's this dilemma, let's be realistic, let's produce ideas that are useful, um, and, and, and just be aware of the political context in which we are working, each with our individual role. I'm as a think tanker, the policy makers are producing the ideas and discussing them and consulting them. On the other hand, I do think, um, and it's not easy to say this, in fact, it's very difficult to say this in this city at the moment, but I, I think I can say it here. Um, the debate is very uninspiring. Um, the proposals, it's hard to imagine the proposals winning the hearts and minds of European citizens. Um, they are based on very, a very binary set of ideas, more or less. Oh, that's the Juncker scenario, the Juncker five scenarios. The middle one is we continue as, as we are. The, the others are more of what, of what we want or less of what we want. So, I mean, it really is quite binary. Um, they're very binary in terms of continuing the very traditional approach to European integration between the intergovernmental model and the federalist model. And, if I may say so, um, it's ex exceedingly a debate which is dominated by white, middle-aged men, right? Um, which is a bit annoying <coughs> when you're a woman. Hmm? Um, um, and so the temptation to want to inject a bit of chaos, you know, the other things, but I'd like to focus on democracy in Europe, in the United States, um, and probably elsewhere. The, um, I think the crisis really is in the relationship between citizens and their elected governments, in the way political, in which political parties are no longer playing a sort of transmission role between elected and electors. Um, and this has opened up spaces for actors who have taken advantage of that space, um, but ultimately with the, the goal of destroying what has been created um, since the end of the Second World War. In Europe, I think this phenomenon is particularly uh, crucial because it, it reflects, one is the impact of globalization, but the other is actually also Europeanization, in the sense that there is a dimension, an element to Europeanization, which makes decision-making twice removed from the citizenship, from the citizen. 
Um, and this is something that has never really been sufficiently addressed in the European construction. The so-called democratic deficit and, and the measures um, produced in order to address it have never been, in my view, satisfactory. Um, I, I am, again, I can't really say this when I'm talking to my policy-making friends, but I don't believe the European Parliament ought to have more powers until it is much more legitimate and, and seen as a legitimate co-decision uh, maker. So I think that, um, and also, just to add to that, we've had Europeanisation and we've had a parallel trend of subsidiarity, so-called subsidiarity, but national governments have been cutting funds at local level, so it's, it's really a bit of a, a masquerade. So I think that the, one of the solutions to address the, the crises in Europe is actually to think about democracy. And of course there's an EU pillar to it, but there's also a national pillar to it, there's a local pillar to it, and there's an international one as well. So these are my broad thoughts. Hmm? Um, I'd just like to make one observation, I guess it's one, on where we stand today, and today I mean 14th of December, and tomorrow, 15th of December, European Council meeting. And this is, um, it's perhaps an entry point, perhaps. So, to my knowledge, the leaders walked in today with four issues, four items on the agenda. There are probably more, but these are the really important ones, the existential ones, right? One is, um, well, the first, we know what the outcome will be. The European Council, the leaders will agree that the deal reached with Theresa May last week represents sufficient progress. I call it a fudge, um, and and um, we'll see how things are going to go. This is going to be consuming Europeans, where I include the Brits, um, for the whole of 2018. Then they will walk in and pretend to have a discussion on Eurozone, but maybe André Sapir can say a little bit more on that. But I see no consensus on reforming Eurozone governance and the basic principles <coughs> of how economic life should be organised in the EU. Then they will have a quarrel over migration issues, where the, the, the issue is not even how to run migration, but it's actually whether the Commission should have a role at all in governing one of the greatest uh, trends, macro trends, global trends of our time. And then they'll walk out with an agreement on PESCO. Now, having worked on foreign and security policy for many years, this was not to be expected. This has been the area. Sorry, PESCO, Permanent Structured Cooperation. I'm assuming that everybody knows what that is, but anyway, it's an agreement on defense and security policy. It's not groundbreaking in practical terms, but politically, I think it's actually quite significant. So my, my and we can talk more about it if that's what you're interested in, I think I should come to an end here. Um, my question is, well, maybe we need to turn the whole debate on the future of Europe upside down. Maybe we should start from foreign and security policy this, today, which was the end point. Uh, the, or, you know, it wasn't even discussed until the, the end of the Cold War. And just, you know, if the rest is too difficult, maybe we should reinvent Europe around international issues. I would personally be very much in favour of this, um, because obviously that reflects my personal interests. And I also think that the greatest achievement of the European Union has actually been as a model for peace and democracy. Um, but maybe that would be a way of turning the debate on its head and finding a new entry point into shaking things up a little bit, uh, introducing that little bit of chaos that I was mentioning earlier, if the sort of you know, uh, tried and tested ground of economic integration, etc., is not going to work. That's it. Thank you. How did he came to Europe and to European integration? A la méthode Monet, when it is too difficult, try another way and to come then to solutions. And perhaps, let's say, the, the way of, first of all, having a foreign policy and secondly, have a uh, defence would be, would be a perfect uh, uh, way. I would like, indeed, uh, to focus uh, my uh, uh, introduction here 
to uh, what is the future of European defence. And then later on in Q&A we can talk on, on, on other elements because I've been introduced as a, a soldier now for an Air Force, you see the blue, oh, is, 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 a little bit, is a little bit strange and most of my career was in the political military, <laughs> far politically, so I'm ready also to answer uh, more political questions. But let me then let go uh, to uh, the issue of what about European defence? Because here we have an example or where we make progress still with the words of Solana, with the speed of light, compared to the other policies of the European uh, Union. I'm going also to be a little bit provocative, but I will be provocative for the sake of debate. And Brexit will be somewhere in the room while I'm talking and being a little bit provocative. So bear with me for 10 minutes, fast and seat belts. Here we go. <laughs> We indeed entered a new geostrategic era where uh, power politics are back. And I don't think that we are even at the element of balance of power. We are just power politics, not yet the balance. And the second element is that there are no borders anymore between external and internal security. They are evaporating before our eyes. So indeed, we have to do something. We are at a crossroad. And when at a crossroad, there's always this African proverb that comes to my mind. If you don't know what road to take, look behind to see where you're coming from. So I will now not dwell too long to history, but just pinpoint to some of the lessons learned of the last century. I think that World War I and World War II gave us the following lesson. That is that a system of absolute sovereign national states is the shortest avenue to absolute competition between those states and is the shortest way to war. <coughs> Hence, the League of Nations and then the improved version of the United Nations. Fortunately, in the continent, we complemented that with the European integration. And when I say fortunately with the continent, I would like to point to a politician from that period who was eager to join with his country this European integration, who was even proposing at a certain moment to merge his country with France. But Winston Churchill admitted that it was not strong enough to make sure that his political party would <coughs> follow him in this very, very revolutionary move. After World War II, we had indeed two existential questions. No more war, that was one. But there was another one. And that was, how can we provide a social economic model that gives welfare to the large part of our citizens? At the time, it was not populism that was threatening us, as we mentioned to you. No, it was communism. And that's one of the reasons why we developed the European community for coal and steel, to make sure of that. So that is perhaps one reason for us now to keep the European Union, to ensure that we can do so for the large majority of our citizens, to give them a system of social welfare and take part of that. And on defence, indeed, a split of a second, we were thinking about the European defence community, and then later on we turned to NATO, because it was no longer war among European countries. The Cold War was blooming, and so it was NATO. And it worked perfectly. Up to what moment? Indeed, Yugoslavia. And the rest is known by all of you. And it brought us to Saint Malo, and that was very good. UK and France. And the lessons learned over there was that neither France nor the United Kingdom, who are, had the autonomy to launch a military operation of the magnitude that we needed for years later. After all, not that big a country. Even a bilateral agreement wouldn't do it. So the first level to do that was the European Union. And from that moment on, at least in the writing, <coughs> ESDP, as it called, was it called at the time, this European security piece had a lift off. I still remember the period of the convention where we were trying to write a constitution for the European Union and where I was in contact with the officials from London and Paris working on something like PESCO, 
It was their initiative. We in Belgium was in favor. By hoping that giving political support from the real start that later on they would accept us as a member. So there was this lift off at that period. For crisis management, we had to have this autonomy. And then came the Deus Ex Machina. The intervention in Iraq. And there we come to the political world. We were completely divided in Europe, politically. As divided as one can be. United Kingdom, joint. United States and the rest is known. France and Germany were against it. At that particular moment, our countries were at the moment in the process of developing a national headquarter that could take the lead of a potential operation that the European Union, if they would launch a mission. That was the case in Great Britain, in France, in Germany, in Italy, and Greece because of that. And at a given moment, two leaders, France and Germany, said, stop, we're not going to develop something in Potsdam and in the neighborhood of Paris. What we will do, we will establish a joint national headquarters on Belgian soil. And Belgium and Luxembourg would participate, which is absolute a sovereign decision of nations. It's not the European headquarters. What happened at the time? In London, they made a caricature out of it. They called it a duplication of shape. While the number of military that we had in mind at the time was exactly the number of police, <coughs> gendarmerie, yeah. assuring the entrance of the compound in shape and controlling the people going into the building. That is still the same figure today. Nothing more, so it was a caricature. But that caricature was created and alive in Great Britain together with another caricature, that we were at the brink of establishing a European army. Can you consider Juncker recruiting military and paying them? Of course that was not the case. But the caricature is over there. So from that moment on, neither Labour nor the Conservatives could be in favour of something like ESDP, CSDP or whatever. It would be political suicide. So, ha, we dropped for quite a period. 2004, up to what? A new Deus Ex Machina. This time from the United States. Obama. We had in 2012 a NATO meeting in Chicago, followed by a G8. We were still eight at the time. Followed by G20. And what did Mr. Herman Perlomper, the then President of the Council, witnessed that the impact of the European Union as such and of the European countries present there, UK, France, Germany and Italy, on military affairs were suboptimal. On geopolitics, suboptimal. Even on geoeconomics, suboptimal. And then when he returned in his flight back to Brussels, he decided to put European defense on the agenda, no longer only of Minister of Defense, but heads of state and government. And he also witnessed that the sentence from Washington on crisis management, even at the time already of Bush Jr. in his second tenure, and the sentence that Obama gave us on crisis management was as follows. Dear European friends, come on, sometimes come on, you will be on your own. And with Trump, that phrase is a little bit shorter. <laughs> So there, so there we were. And what's now the net result? That in that very short period, we now have something like PESCO. And you don't know what it is. But we also have CART, an annual review from heads of state and government on the obligations that countries are taking to PESCO. We have the Commission on board with, uh, with uh, this with the European Defence Fund. I worked for hours and hours and years and years, next to my ambassadors, Corey Pair and PESC and, and PSC. And from just the snitches, you can look to Berlin. In between, there is Rue de la Loire. I always had the impression during those years that crossing the Rue de la Loire at that particular point was more difficult than to cross the Suez Canal. <laughs> that one is over now. This is a dramatic, a dramatic change. So, 
there, there, there we are. Pop, pop, pop. So, let's not turn to Brexit and the military elements. But here I would like to refer once again to history and one particular lesson to learn. I don't know if you're still familiar with the West European Union, this organization that was created <coughs> right after the Second World War with Great Britain as one of the uh, constituting uh, uh, elements on defense. And later on, while Europe was growing and NATO was having more members, within the WU, full members, they were so generous to other countries that they established special relationships. And the special relationship with associated members and associated partners were such that in the end, the full members had lost their autonomy of decision making. WU was broken beyond repair and be transferred to the European Union. But with one lesson in mind, never again we will keep the decision making only for the full members. Meaning that if United Kingdom is leaving the European Union, you will have a special arrangement on coordination, but nothing on co-decision. And we can talk about the kinds of cooperation because the, there is a multiple during the question and answers. So that is one scenario. The second scenario that I can see in Brexit is that we have to give time to the Brexit process so that it eventually can kill Brexit. Mm -hmm. That is my preferred option. Yeah. <laughs> the third option is UK is leaving the European Union and a couple of years later is coming back to the European Union. But bear in mind one thing. Now we have revolutionary elements to develop our future European defense. In the months and in the years to come, and you can easily compare it to the European Monetary Union. It was not heaven on earth from day one. But look where we're standing now. And I think that uh, we will make progress in the coming months and years. So whenever you will return, to the European Union. All that will be key. And in the meantime, yes, we are establishing headquarters. And I was one of the usual suspects over there. Mm -hmm. By the way, so was Juncker, because at the time he was Prime Minister of Luxembourg. And Dieter Hofstadt, at the time he was Prime Minister of, of Belgium. So, there we are. I have hope for the United Kingdom, and I have certainty for the European Union. We will match. With all of you, nice to see you. I am Harden. Uh, we worked together 20 years ago on a project on flexible integration. Now, I'm going to talk about two things. <coughs> One is about sort of widening and uh, deepening. And uh, give you some thoughts that uh, I've changed my mind on some of those matters. And the other, obviously, is about the Eurozone, uh, since I was asked to, uh, to, uh, to, to talk about that as well. Now, let me say something about uh, widening and, uh, and deepening. Uh, since, indeed, we are uh, celebrating a, a 50th anniversary, uh, so going back to you know, where the European Union was also uh, 50 years ago, uh, it was a, a much smaller union, right? We were still then uh, six uh, six countries. That was more or less on the eve of the the UK, Denmark, and uh, and uh, an Ireland uh, joining the uh, the EU. And um, we were a common market, but a common market that was not a single market, right? It was sort of a, a rather minimum kind of, uh, of, of of common market, and. When in the 1980s, uh, Helen was talking about the, uh, the single market mm. program, uh, the 1980s were about two things, right? It was about deepening and it was about widening, right? It was after there'd been the first enlargement with the, with the UK and the other two countries, uh, the 1980s was the enlargement to Southern Europe. 
uh, Greece first, and then uh, Spain and Portugal. And by accident, more or less, it came at the same time as we were deepening with the single market. Still long before Schengen or long before the, the Euro, but we were deepening. And, and the view was, and I think that was, uh, that was my view as well, uh, you know, as people were debating uh, widening and, uh, and, uh, and deepening, uh, there was lots of discussion, mostly among the political scientists, as to whether there was a trade-off uh, between the two. And I think that the established view, I'm sure everybody on the panel here probably had that view, uh, me as well, was that, no, there is no trade-off. Right? Look at how we, uh, in the European Union, we are able uh, to walk on those two legs. We are able to enlarge the European Union to a more, uh, uh, to a different group of countries, uh, different, uh, you know, the, the, the Southern European certainly were, were different politically, socially, economically. Uh, and we were uh, deepening the, the single market. And indeed, if you look back at the Delors project, was, you know, we to reconcile the two, you know, with the structural funds and recognizing that, you know, as we were uh, deepening and because they've been widening into a different set of countries, th there was a challenge of, of convergence. And uh, I think as we were looking back, say, 10 years, 15 years later, uh, I think the view was, and my view as well, was, yes, it had been a success. We had managed, indeed, to surmount what some had perceived to be a, a trade-off. No, there had not been a trade-off in reality. We had put in place mechanisms, policies, in order to have a success, both of the uh, widening, of the enlargement, the sudden enlargement, and the uh, single market program. But then I think it came to other, uh, I think, major, uh, major changes. Uh, one was the Monetary Union, 99, sort of a further uh, deepening, and then the uh, enlargement in the uh, in the mid 2000s to to the east, to Central and Eastern Europe this time. And by that time, um, also the the economic situation were, was not quite the same as it had been before. Uh, so we were a more, much more heterogeneous uh, Europe. Uh, we had never been so heterogeneous uh, as we were uh, after after 2004 and uh, but I think and we had deepened deepened with the, the monetary union deepened with Schengen as well uh, to, to talk of a, of a different issue and I think we were still and I certainly was still uh, of the mindset of the 1980s and the 1980s of no trade-off between the widening and uh, the deepening no as I look today, in 2017, um, I have less uh, that view uh, than I used to. And, uh, and certainly, as I look today, also after the vote uh, in the UK last year to leave, where I do believe that uh, the, those two elements of the widening we know the debate about uh, migration in the UK, but I think also, uh, as I'm sure many of you have read the uh, very interesting uh, uh, essay by the former uh, UK uh, permanent rep in Brussels about uh, the Euro <coughs> and how the UK felt isolated uh, during the uh, Eurozone crisis because uh, the real discussion was not anymore in the in the ECOFIN. The real discussion was in the uh, in the Eurogroup. And so, you know, even though we had the mind before that, you know, sure, it's uh, countries should go ahead and experiment. I don't know whether that's quite a flexible integration. It was a you know a further experimentation than maybe I would, as you remember, I was. I had some doubts about some of the things that we were doing. But, you know, the notion that, sure, there should be an avant-garde of countries experimenting, that has always been the case in, in Europe. And that, you know, who should be against experimentation? And then after that, other countries would join. I'm quite, uh, and I think we cannot be blind. It's a topic we don't like to, to talk about in, in, in Brussels. 
I think one cannot ignore that the UK uh, was not in Schengen, was not in the monetary, is not in the uh, in the monetary union, and fell at some stage. You can say of its own of its own fault. I'm not saying uh, that the UK doesn't bear a huge uh, responsibility, but nonetheless, we did create a two-class uh, citizenship uh, situation in Europe. And I think it was felt by 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 the UK. And it's interesting, I think, that if you look at the Visegrad countries, and you know, you will say immediately, well, there are four Visegrad countries, of which one uh, is a Euro area member, Slovakia, uh, and that is true. Uh, and I find it sort of a, a puzzling situation, actually, the, the, the Slovak situation. But if you look at the three others, uh, the Czech, the Poles, and the Hungarians, um, we see your, you know, how they feel about uh, EU membership. And we see that we have a problem. We have a problem in, in, the, in the family. And so I, I do think that both on economic ground and on, uh, on political ground, um, we should and probably still must manage better the fact that we have uh, this widening and this deepening. And in that sense, and not to, to come to the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the Eurozone, I'm very happy that finally, uh, when we are going to have the uh, Eurozone Summit uh, tomorrow, I suppose, uh, all countries will be invited to the Eurozone Summit. So it will not just be a summit among the Eurozone member countries, but it will be a summit uh, where all countries uh, will, be, will be present. I think that's, that's very, very important. I think it was a huge mistake uh, not to do that also in the, uh, in the Eurogroup. I think we should have managed that uh, much, much better. So let me come to the, uh, to the, Eurozone, uh, to the Eurozone crisis. Um, I think we probably all agree that um, the uh, Maastricht arrangement for uh, economic and monetary union um, was um, very imperfect and highly unusual in a sense. Uh, we have not in history uh, created many monetary unions uh, without preceding it with, uh, with political union. That is not the way the U.S. Uh, history uh, proceeded. Uh, that is not the way German history uh, proceeded. And it's not by accident, obviously, that it is in Germany that there was hesitation of many to say that, look, uh, monetary union is a great idea, but we should first have uh, a political union. And that was not the case. We proceeded um, with the monetary union where monetary policy uh, was uh, with the federal institution, uh, the uh, European Central Bank. Uh, we did create a, a European uh, machine, uh, luckily. And then all the other policies uh, remain at the national level with some form of coordination. Uh, I, to say immediately, I've never been a believer. I've never understood what coordination means. Uh, <laughs> Up to today, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm puzzled by uh, coordination. Sounds very nice. You know, who is against coordination? Uh, you know, we meet and we discuss and we do things. And coordination looks like a very, sounds like cooperation. And, you know, who is against cooperation? Uh, I'm not against cooperation. I'm not against coordination. Does it deliver? No, I don't believe it, uh, it delivers. What is delivering in the monetary union is the monetary policy with the European Central Bank. Uh, the coordination of the other policies, uh, whether it's the fiscal policy or whether it's the myriad of other policies, uh, I have uh, I've really my doubt uh, about it. Now, anyway, that's the way that's the way we proceed. I think with very very weak uh, instruments and um, the monetary union with the monetary policy delivered uh, very rapidly. Uh, I mean, that was really remarkable. Uh, the ECB became immediately a world standard uh, central bank. Uh, there is no doubt that the ECB today, but very rapidly after its creation, became uh, as good a central bank as the Bank of England, uh, as, the, as the Federal Reserve. It became really world standard, there's no doubt. I'm not saying better, but as good, on par. That was, that was remarkable. The time it took, 
very, very short time to be a credible player at the table and uh, to manage monetary policy and everything that comes with monetary policy with the extreme, uh, extremely high uh, quality. Uh -huh. And so everything looked very fine. And the central bank told us that uh, its its uh, its mandate that it had received from the treaty is price stability. The ECB said that price stability means two percent inflation or close to but below two percent. And bank uh, the central bank delivered almost the next day. Uh, and we had all the time until the crisis at least two percent inflation and everything looked very nice until, until the crisis hit us. And when the crisis hit us, we, we then understood, and that was an eye-opener even for people like me who had worked on, on this and you know, realized some of the lacunes of, of the system, we realized that we were really not ready for a financial crisis. Uh, the system had not been designed. And you know, if you look in the treaty, we talk a lot about price stability, but we don't talk much about financial stability. There's only one reference, only one reference in the treaty. Luckily, there is at least one reference, because that's what allowed the creation of the, of the banking union when it was, when it was needed. Uh, but there was no, basically, you can see that it was a treaty for, for peacetime. It was not a treaty, uh, as far as monetary union is concerned, as, you know, when, when the Bank of England, when the Bank of Sweden, the oldest central bank in the world, or when the Federal Reserve were, were created, they were always created at the time of banking crisis. In a sense, we were lucky or unlucky when the ECB was created, it was in peacetime. Uh, there was no banking crisis, no financial crisis. There had been problems of price stability, and therefore the whole outlook was on, on price stability. So we were not ready for a financial crisis. You know, it's like having a fire without having a firehouse someplace, and people are trained to deal with the fire. And that's pretty tough to extinguish a fire. And Obviously, it took, uh, it took time. And then when the sovereign debt crisis hit us, uh, starting in 2010 with Greece, and had it been only Greece, this would not have been uh, a Euro area crisis. It would have been a Greek crisis. Uh, but obviously, uh, it was not just Greece. It was Greece, and then it was uh, Portugal. Uh, it was Ireland. Uh, it was Cyprus. It was Spain. And it nearly was uh, Italy uh, as well. And so when the sovereign uh, debt crisis hit us, we also were not, uh, were not ready. And so by 2012, luckily, I mean, this starts to 2008, the financial crisis, 2010, the sovereign debt crisis. But by 2012, I think governments, although they don't become a political union, obviously, by 2012, you know, they don't sort of say, no, we need to be a political union in order to have re a strong monetary union, but they do take political decisions. And the political decisions that they, they, they take, uh, the significant political decisions, it seems to me, that they take in 2012 are the creation, on the one hand, of the uh, European stability uh, mechanism with the 700 or 500 billion euro, sort of a big number, uh, to impress uh, markets and, and citizens. That's good. And uh, they take the decision in June 2012 to create a, a banking union. Those are two political decisions. And I think it's only because those two political decisions are taken uh, in 2012 that in the summer of 2012, Mario Draghi is able, in London, uh, to make the declaration that, that he made, that you know, the ECB will uh, do everything that it can uh, to, uh, to, uh, to protect the uh, the, the euro, and then mostly introduce the famous OMT, the, 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 the monetary program. I think 2012 was the turnaround. Obviously, there were many other things that came, change of monetary policy, change of fiscal policy, that helped. And so, what I, I just want to do now, in uh, two minutes, is to you know, say, where are we today, and uh, are the problems of the euro area behind us? Uh, what is there still to do, and are we going to, or are they, the, those who are meeting not far from here, are they going to take the decisions uh, to, to, to do, uh, not whatever it takes, but uh, to do uh, the, right, the right stuff. So I would say that, indeed, what was done in 2012 was very important. The banking union was very, very important. 
the, uh, the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, was very important. And certainly today we are living uh, a cyclical recovery and uh, you know, we feel much better about uh, the situation today that we did back in, in, 20, uh, in 2012. Unemployment is much, uh, is much lower. Growth is not fantastic, but at least it's back. But I think it's true that it's still sh it's a shallow recovery. It's not a fantastic recovery. It's a, it's a recovery. And, uh, and it's been uh, many quarters of recovery. That's great. But it's a recovery also against still fragilities. And the fragilities, they are both economic and financial. And economic because we see that growth is not, uh, is not super, super... Uh, high and there's lots of debt out there. There's not just public debt; there's also private debt. <coughs> so those are the fragilities, and we see also that from the instruments that we have, what was created with the banking union and, and the ESM, uh, there still needs to be more needs to be done. And I think there is a discussion today, uh, and that's what I will end with. There is a discussion today whether. You know, all, is, is it all that we need to do is sort of reinforce the banking union? Or do we also need a fiscal, uh, a fiscal union? And I do think that this is a misguided, uh, this is a misguided distinction uh, between the two. Uh, I do very much believe that uh, we need to reinforce the ESM, whether we want to call it the European Monetary Fund or something else, doesn't really matter, but I think we do need to strengthen the mechanism in the discussion, we could, we could get into some of the, the specifics of that. So the ESM is good, but it could be better. It could be a better crisis management instrument, and I think it should be. Because I think that is our first priority. Our first priority is not so much about fiscal stabilization. It would be great to have fiscal stabilization. It would be great to have a big Euro, Euro, European or Euro area budget, but this is not, this is not forthcoming. But I think we need a crisis management mechanism, which the ESM is, but something, uh, something better. But the ESM needs to be backed by something fiscal. And the, the, the banking union, sorry, needs to be backed by uh, something fiscal, because the banking union is an important element here. And that's the ESM. So the ESM needs to be seen as the element of the fiscal union, although here uh, playing a role with the, with the banking union, which is the crisis management fiscal union. So it's not a fiscal union to do stabilization. Uh, just said, would be nice, but it's not uh, urgent. What is really urgent is to have the ESM, whether it is transformed or not into the European Monetary Fund, to be able to better deal uh, with crisis and not deal with crisis as we have done so far, ultima ratio, the end of the, of the euro, as we nearly had a few times in, uh, in, 20, in 2012. That is not the way one deals with financial crisis. Anybody who has studied a little bit and has gone through financial crisis knows that one needs to deal early with financial crisis, not late. Time is not on your side with financial crisis. The more time elapses, the more the problem accumulates. So you need to deal early with those problems. And so we need an instrument, call it again the ESM, call it the European Monetary Fund, that would be able to act much more, much earlier in a crisis rather than ultima ratio, when there is uh, only the uh, drama that would follow if we don't act. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will be <coughs> addressing the question of migration. Um, and so I'm in the in the lovely position of having a number of points already <coughs> touched on that I will that I will build on um, because many of those are of course relevant for migration. Um, but uh, but I will talk about that first of all. I, I want to start with one thing. Uh, just a, a little a little quiz uh, for, for you. Uh, for those of you who think that I want to know what percent of the world's population do you think are migrants today. So those of you who think that 25% or more of the world's population are migrants, can I just have a, have a show of hands? Got one hand, okay, two hands, three. Okay, Depends so a bit what you call migrants, isn't it? What is a migrant? Exactly, what is a migrant? A migrant by the UN definition is somebody who is living outside the, the country of birth or nationality. You're talking of flows, not of stock. Uh, no, I'm talking about stock. 
Okay, no Talking about stocks. So the difference between stocks and flows are stocks are migrants who are currently in a country. <coughs> flows are people who move in a particular period of time. Um, okay, so we've got a couple of hands on 25% of more of migrants. So some of the living outside country of birth and nationality. Oh, 15% to 25%? A couple more hands, okay. Um, say 5% to 10%? Most hands. What if I tell you it's 3%? Of the world population. The numbers that you read, which it is, uh, officially, according to official figures, which are as related by national censuses to the UN. And so you will see the figure of 244 million migrants in the world. And quite rightly, those data say this is the largest number of international migrants that we've ever had. But what else do we have? We also have the largest population the world's ever had, right? So actually, the percent of international migrants has stayed about stable since they really started counting in 1960, between 2.4 and, and 3%. Now, shall we look at the EU? 25% or more? How many do you think of migrants? And here I'm counting mobility as well as migration. So people who are born in an EU country other than the one they're living in, as well as people like myself who are third country nationals who are living in the European Union. 25% or more? Couple hands, okay. A um, couple of hands, all right. And what do we got? So uh, 15 to just under 25? Couple, okay. Um, oh, what did I say? Um, 10 Five, to 15? A couple of hands. Under 10%. A couple of hands. There it's actually 11%. Um, it, is, it is higher within the European Union. But my point is, is does this constitute a migration <laughs> crisis? Is this, and so this is why I, I choose to call this a so-called crisis, but I'm not really sure this is a, a crisis. For someone like Lebanon, whose uh, population has increased fully by 25% in two years, now that is definitely a crisis. But this is one of the things that, and this is where I, I differ from my, from my colleagues and that I am purely an academic and not, not a practitioner, um, and that, that when we look at the European Union and migration, that one of the things that gets lost in translation a little bit is that it is the communities that are dealing are dealing with with uh, with migration, with refugee flows, with asylum seekers, and that's something that then gets handed back up to the to the highest level. But it's not a crisis for the entire European Union. There are communities that are very very heavily affected, but that's something that is those communities in some way you could argue which are which are driving this entire dialogue. And this really this has shifted into something that. Crisis management has been man, has been allowed to dominate discourse. Much as Rosa said that, that we can talk about it as a crisis of communication, perhaps a crisis of democracy. Um, Joe mentioned the concept of a caricature, uh, and I think all of those apply to migration because when you look at what really is going on with migration, it's not the the image that that was that that is that is projected. Um, I can talk about about uh, Britain and uh, and migration in, in Q and A. Um, but there too, um, that was something that, that became a caricature of, of, of what, what was going on. Uh, in fact, if you look at uh, votes in the referendum to leave, uh, remain votes were higher in areas where there was higher migration and, and higher migrant participation. So that tells you that it's really a question of the crisis of communication. And as Rosa mentioned, those people who have been able to dominate, dominate the discourse um, than really a crisis of, of migration um, itself. Um, the other figure I just want to toss out um, is that it's often said that the current refugee flows, we'll say, not crisis, uh, in the European Union today are the largest since World War II. That's absolutely true. But what we have to think about is, that, let's think about this, the, the flows were entirely in Europe in World War II, and there were 60 million people. Today we're talking about 3 million people. So it is absolutely correct that it is the largest flow in Europe since, or war, uh, in, in the, the, the number of refugees in the world is indeed the largest it has ever been in terms of absolute numbers. And that is absolutely something that needs to be addressed. But comparing 60 million and 3 million is, is something that, again, we need, we need to, to put these in, into, into perspective. Um, and when we talk about this, um, that, that is something that we, we, do, we do always need to, to make sure we, we bear in mind. Um, <clears throat> so we have a sort of fundamental misunderstanding of, of what's going on that. And one of the other things that, that when we can think about migration um, in national levels, but also in the European Union level, um, the various institutions, is that migration does not move. And this is something very much what, what Andre talked about with this idea of, of, uh, of the cycles that, 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 we, that we move in. Um, that um, migration and integration don't work in electoral cycles. 
They, migration, integration, does not work in three, four, five, or six year cycles. It works in 10, 20, 30 year cycles. And so that's something that, that when governments are saying migrants are insufficiently integrated, and a small group of very um, outspoken individuals are demanding action, then governments need to take action. But the, but the challenge there is what do they do? Do they do something immediate, or do they do something longer term? As where, where, what Andre also mentioned about uh, that at the point with the financial crisis, the time to take action was early on. I knew as early as 2012 that the combination of Dublin and Schengen was going to be a problem. I said this, and I was told, ah, don't worry about it, you know, the institutions <laughs> will resolve it, it will be fine. Well, in 2011, the European Court of Human Rights declared that Greece was not a safe third country. Uh, safe third country is obviously if, if, a, if an asylum seeker comes through and, and files a claim uh, in an EU country and has come through a safe third country, then they must return to that safe third country and file their refugee, their, their asylum claim there uh, and, gain, and gain refugee status there. The uh, argument being that it's about safety, not about choosing where they're going. Well, Greece was not properly um, processing asylum claims as long ago as 2011. We knew that was a problem, and they were never called on it. They were not ever called on it, and that, that's something that then became the crisis that we have today. And that's something that had it been addressed in 2011, and I don't know what internal discussions went on, maybe, maybe people who have been in, in internal discussions can, can uh, shed some light on that, but, the, but Greece was not called on it. They did not have proper uh, asylum processing mechanisms in 2011, and they, that's one reason why they're struggling today. Um, and th this is something that when we talk about the future of Europe and, and what, what is going on, one of, the, one of the proposals would be for a unified um, asylum processing center. Until the asylum processing claims are at the highest level of the, of the, um, of the I'll say, say the, the, the states with the, with the highest refugee recognition rates, they are not going to accept that. Because that, that is something that right now you have a vast distinction, and I don't actually have numbers at my fingertips, but I can, I can assure you, you have huge differences ranging from 5% recognition rates for one nationality to 80% recognition rates for the same nationality in another EU state. No wonder they don't want to go to Poland or Hungary. <laughs> uh, and so this is something that, that when, you, when, you, when, you, when you start looking at, at these figures, um, these are things that, that really we need to get down into these details, and that's what they're, what they're quarreling about uh, down, down the road. Um, and so the reactive, so we need to be proactive. And that's something that can still be done. It's not too late for that. But, but it needs to be recognized today that proactive migration policies need to be put in place and not reactive ones. Um, uh, so this question of, of relocation that just mentioned yesterday is, is, a, is a lost cause and, and he was criticized for it. Well, he, he's right. It's a lost cause for two, two reasons right now. One, it was imposed on not, not one, but two groups of people. It was imposed on states who didn't want it, and it was imposed on refugees who didn't want to move to certain states. In part because you do not have the uh, coordination of uh, common asylum, asylum policies. I mean, you have the common asylum policies, but they're minimum standards. And of course, some countries then, then go to higher standards. Um, but so the minimum standards are just that, minimum standards. Um, and refugees were not, were not consulted in that, in that process. Um, one of the um, things about, about the Dublin Convention, which is where regulation now sits, which has all sorts of exceptions to it, but they're almost never applied. One of those, if you have a family member in another state, you can go to that state. Now, and this is the thing that if we can think about Dublin starting to be actually applied with the exceptions, I understand the Parliament has just uh, voted on, on a complete overhaul, but I haven't found a text of that yet, um, and so that's something that we have to see what, what that, that will be. Um, and so sort of thinking forward to the, to the future, future of all this, um, I think we're going to move forward um, gradually, as, as, as we have. Um, any of the, the sort of large leaps forward um, with common asylum processing is not, is not yet there. Um, we have to bring, and this is where we come back to this widening and deepening argument again, um, that relocation is predicated on, on that deepening. A common asylum processing center is predicated on that, on that deepening. Um, and that's something that when we think about the, the sort of word of the day is, is either burden sharing or, or responsibility sharing, 
And I think one of the things that, that perhaps may be a way forward is to think about how that responsibility um, is in fact uh, allocated, how it is shared. And it may be a question of being shared backward and forward. That Greece did not have assistance many years ago. Um, and this is something that, that when we think of, of where do we deal with the responsibility, how do we process this, how do we share this, <coughs> that, that an, an equal distribution of asylum seekers. When I'm talking about an equal distribution of refugees, I misspoke earlier, we're speaking about an equal distribution of asylum seekers ac across, across countries. And so then it is still up to the individual member state as to whether they grant that individual refugee status or not. That, that is something that if we're going to move toward that, it is going to have to be with, with buy-in from refugees, uh, with, sorry, asylum seekers, it is going to have to be with buy-in uh, from states. And it may not be possible to do an equal distribution across the entire European Union. And that's why I say I think we need, we need to think about what type of responsibility sharing we have. Um, and and that, that's where we may have, have perhaps more of the, I'll, I'll use the phrase, the two-speed Europe um, on that front. Um, thank you, and I'll, I'll stop there. I was thinking as you were talking, Amanda, um, it's not only about deep it's also about whether governments or the European institutions have actually got the capacity to do and make a decent job of yes. implementing Absolutely. Something. We in the UK are about to be faced, I could pull out of my bag for you, the reports that have just been produced on whether we manage our borders properly. We don't even manage our borders properly in the whole. The European Court of Auditors has just slammed the UK for apparently, allegedly, letting in substandard Chinese goods, which mm -hmm. then find their way elsewhere in the European Union. We're about to be faced with the challenge of redressing all those damn people from other European countries who are living in the UK. And mm -hmm. We don't know how to do it. We actually don't know how to do it. So it's not only that Greece doesn't yeah, have the capacity. To, so there's a, a whole bundle of capacity questions there. Yeah. Um, as well as the kind of, you know, the kind of high ground of deepening and, and so on and so forth. And I think that's really challenging. We've got, how long we've got, and I think that's really challenging. We've got, how long obvious area where you could get more for less. Better, more and better equipment, more cheap. Why isn't it happening? <laughs> and how, how can we deal, how can we make it happen? Was somebody there, please? Yeah. yeah. That's for you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Antonio Calcara. I'm a PhD candidate at Lewis University, Rome. And I'm a visiting researcher at the Braille University in Brussels. I'm working on military companies and defense procurement, so I, oh. I, I, I have to say that I'm not so optimistic <coughs> about European defense like uh, the panelists. So I have two questions. One for Mr. Colman, this is about PESCO, because the process of negotiation of PESCO was not like so straightforward, there were two different visions, like the French one that uh, they want to create a sort of ex exclusive uh, uh, framework with an avant-garde of countries that go forward, and the German ones that want to create like a widening uh, and broad, broad framework. So what is your take on this? Mm -hmm. Even Given that there were uh, <coughs> other initiatives in the past, even different like the European Defense Agency, they were agreed by all the member states and they were not successful because simply member states don't put money on that, so it was like ins insignificant in a way. And the second question is for uh, Ms. Balfour, it's about <coughs> German, Germany and it's about the relationship between Germany and, uh, and, and the military field because with Brexit, uh, now in European Defense, Franco-German core is taking the lead. So what about the, this, this relationship given also the, 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 the Libya crisis in 2011 when French and UK intervened, Germany say no thanks. So do you think that there is any change right now in this relationship? No, it's on here. Yeah. Please. Hi, uh, my name is Ragnar Weiland. I'm a PhD student at the University of Bruxelles and the University of Warwick. My question goes in a similar direction as Antonio's question. I was, I was I'm wondering about whether the first two panelists could elaborate a bit further on how they feel Brexit is going to affect the future of EU foreign policy because there seems to be two extreme views. So the one view is that, um, particularly when it comes to the military realm, but even beyond that, that uh, Britain, losing Britain is a major loss in the sense of it's the only country with uh, uh, well, 
one of two countries with, with, uh, with, a relevant, <coughs> with relevant armed forces with uh, strategic deterrent, with the seeking the UN Security Council with a highly competent uh, um, foreign service, whose loss is just a major loss for the EU as a whole. And, um, and, 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 and uh, then there's this other extreme uh, view that says, okay, the Brits have been blocking everything out of stubbornness, uh, even things like joint procurement, even things, like even really minor steps uh, in, 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 diff in various different uh, um, fields, and that losing them as a, as a stumb stumbling block would now unleash the potential uh, that is there. Um, and I was wondering where you would position yourself in that debate. Can I just add to that run of questions? Um, we have been able in recent years to assume, make some quite stable assumptions about the role of <coughs> Germany inside the European Union. All of a sudden that seems to be less clear and in a few months time, after all Angela Merkel might no longer be the Bundeskanzler. And how does that change the scenario? It's not just a Brexit question, there's a German question. Joe. Um, thank you very much. Um, on this first question, that um, can we have more back out of our, uh, let's say uh, bang out of our back, and that uh, defence procurement is, is 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 an area, yes. But then you should ask yourself, how come that we never materialise that? While well, we are talking already 70 years about that in NATO context, and about 40 years in the European Union, there are two reasons for that. And I hope that PESCO will change that one. First of all, how do we set up our respective white box livre blanc in our countries? In a room much smaller than this one, okay. without windows, in absolutely closed. And when the last word is written, and the last dot is given, we say, no changes allowed. We go, go to the outside world and we say, this has been coordinated in NATO and in the UN, even the UN, and of course in the European Union. Not at all. Not at all. And there you are. And you need your equipment at that particular moment. And the other one needs two years later, five years earlier. There you are. One thing. The second element is industry. In the United States, we have the last supper about 15 years ago, when the Minister of Defence said, no, henceforward, I want two companies for an air car, a framework. I want two companies, because there was competitions needed, for the engines. E allora e basta. <laughs> and there were mergers. <coughs> we are not yet in the mergers. So there are two elements that we have to struggle with. What are we now doing within, within PESCO is henceforward, and there will be an annual review <coughs> and we will now like, let's say, to harmonize the procurement. How can you do that? The best thing is, the programs that are now already identified, sorry, too late, is to tackle it with the research and the development and then later on with the prototype. Mm -hmm. And that is why a very small fund at present a little bit better, huge but uh, more substantial uh, budget later on, on research and development and financing the, uh, let's say, prototypes by the Commission, by the way, on the condition that you work together and on the condition that it is about capabilities th that are covering or well-known shortfalls. So that's the reason why we were so unsuccessful in the past, and yes, I've been writing also white books, leave on blog, etc. I know it. And why I have, let's say, finally this element. Um, so, inclusive versus exclusive. Right. And also the PESCO put forward at the time by United Kingdom and France was a very select group. And I was advocating, yes, we will support that, not being sure that Belgium would be able to join the PESCO at the time. Mm -hmm. So the PESCO we have now is quite different from the PESCO mm -hmm. okay. Will we be able, because everyone is on board yet, Denmark is up the out, Malta, okay, and you are getting, we understand that. We have everything. But perhaps with this element now, 
of research and development and industry and cetera, et cetera, it is better to have the opposition inside than outside. Because if they were outside, there would always be criticism that, oh, but this money of the commission, and I've given that money to the commission as well, is going to projects, and I cannot profit of those projects. I have them in. Hapla. And if they don't do much, I don't bother with a group of countries. With the, with, because the individual projects will always be with a group of countries. So that's the exclusivity over there. And I have the opposition in-house. So that, for me, is fine. And an overall structure for governance, so that's, so that's fine. So I can live, I can live with that. <coughs> Do we have to be very optimistic with PESCO? If it was only PESCO, it would be just another word for meddling too, like pooling and sharing was for another word for meddling too, and smart defense. But PESCO is now together with CART, is now together with this financing mechanism, and is now has finally the attention of heads of state and government. Because if you have a Minister of Defense who is in disagreement with his Minister of Finance, you know it. So I think, let's say, yes, but potentially it is over there. And that is not enough, potentially. But with the outside crisis is now, there are, we are all cliffhangers. <laughs> so, and we are convinced that the only answer is now through the European Union, because if not, we are, we are lacking the money. So I'm not that optimistic for the budget of defense. I'm optimistic for two elements, that henceforward, 2% will be go to research and development, which is quite normal in some countries, which is revolutionary in other ones. 20% will be going into equipment. Revolutionary for some countries, normal for others. Those two are fundamentals. And then later on, I could see that the global budget slowly but surely will go to, let's say, more solidarity amongst countries. So I'm uh, a little bit, uh, uh, I'm hopeful <coughs> for that. UK. Are we losing the UK? <coughs> and are we losing the military capabilities of the United Kingdom? I don't think so. Geographically, UK will remain where it is. Secondly, UK stays within NATO. Thirdly, so far, in UK, UK has furnished 5% of the military that we have deployed so far. Never before in the history of the European integration, so few countries had always to do so much in the name of so many. Mm -hmm. And my country was part of that. Mm -hmm. So, and I think, let's say, that even now, if the European Union is to launch an operation, it will be open for participation of countries. And I can predict that at that moment, perhaps the appetite of Britain will be greater than 5%. So I don't see a problem at all. And even on the procurement side, our industries are that linked. And a matter of fact, UK will be aware of the ongoing programs. Once within the European Union, we have <coughs> developed our programs, and so on, it will be open for other countries to join. The research money will not go to their industry because legally we can't do so. But they will have also these advantages of scale and the product will be at a lower price. So they can add up with so many ships or so and so and so on. Indeed, on projects that we have decided upon uh, in, in the European Union. And there is always the informal information that if we develop such a thing, will it be of interest of the of, of United Kingdom and will they join us as well? That will help. So I don't see I don't see the problem. And on Germany, what I can say on, on Germany, from the military side, at the start, Germany and its armed forces, that was okay on one condition, in NATO and commanded by a U.S. general. Mm -hmm. And then later on, they accepted to deploy military, German military outside of NATO, in Afghanistan, revolutionary, a revolutionary step. We have to take that into consideration. Later on, they joined us in European operations. They even took the lead in an operation in the Congo, of all places, in the Congo. <coughs> and now, they were advocating together with France an element like PESCO. 
this is a very, very huge step. And we should all appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Because that's not easy to sell that in your own country. And they did it. And they did it very well. And here is the Thank you. And I can elaborate. I agree with what Joe said, so I can just add on to that from a less military um, perspective. On Britain, I, I, am, are among those, I am among those who think that Britain has, been a, has contributed enormously to security policy, but also to foreign policy more generally. So it will be a net loss. If you look, just look at the quality of the British uh, diplomats working in the External Action Service who will no longer be there, I, I think they're going to have a human resources issue. Um, my only concern, and uh, but I agree with, with Joe that they will, that <coughs> it is in the interest of both of the UK and of the EU to continue to work together on uh, security and defence. Um, my preoccupation is that if the, if the Brexit negotiations go badly, there will not be sufficient trust to think of the ways in which that cooperation can take place after Britain has, has left. That is, that is my preoccupation. Um, but it's already on the um, list of uh, the to-do list of the High Representative. She, she presented this uh, last night, the to-do list post PESCO, um, and that was to make sure, design mechanisms to improve cooperation with third countries or organizations on CSDP missions. Um, so, you know, that's opening the door to the UK. Um, <clears throat> on Germany, um, I agree with, um, with Joe, and I think, I, can, I think I'm at liberty to share an anecdote that I learned today from Wolfgang Ischinger, who is a um, he's now the chairman or whatever of the M Munich Security Council, but has had a long career in the German uh, diplomacy, mostly focusing on security affairs. And in 1995-96, he was sent to the Balkans to do a, an exploration tour to see whether there was anything Germany could do in the Balkans after the, 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 the end of the, um, uh, of the war um, there. Uh, because they were concerned that because of the Nazi past, they wouldn't be able to do anything. And now, as you mentioned, Congo, Afghanistan, so we're, it's a different planet in that sense. But there is a lot of work that needs to be done for German public. If you look at public opinion polls, Germans is one of the most cosmopolitan societies in terms of exchanges with the rest of the world. It's one of the most insular in terms of taking responsibility for foreign policy. It's quite extraordinary. Um, and they seem to think commercial policy, which, you know, I mean, Germany, the key foreign policy interest of Germany is to sell their goods elsewhere. And their development aid is there to make sure that other countries can buy their goods. I mean, it's, it's quite um, straightforward. Um, they don't get it that this is foreign policy. Mm? So that <coughs> linkage is not made. So a lot of work needs to be done. Um, and I think um, the, the, how the, the, the government formation will be important. Um, um, and, and in this regard, I think I'd just like to add an, an extra comment, which I think goes in the way also of the Future of Europe uh, debate. Um, actually, there are two things I'd like to add, sorry. One is, one debate to follow in Germany is the degree to which this push, this drive towards a stronger global Europe um, is embedded in the debate on transatlanticism or not. I, does Germany want to be more autonomous from the transatlantic relationship or not? And that is actually quite an existential question, but of course Trump, uh, Trump uh, enforces that question on the Germans. Um, the second point I'd like to mention, which, which is actually much more about Europe, is that what we're seeing now, um, in my view, it's, an, it's a very personal observation, um, that Germany has actually been pushing for a more intergovernmental Europe. And when you have periods of crisis or government, uh, you know, long talks for government form formation, it's Austria, Germany, the next one's going to be Italy. So long periods of caretaker governments, um, uh, you know, th th there's, 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 Europe needs to move forward, but because Europe has become so intergovernmental, it's very hard to get to push to have that drive. Um, so at the moment, you know, the, 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 some, some in the Commission 
are worried that Berlin, who are actually, because there's some movement going on in the Commission, there's several ideas being developed, and some are thinking, right, we must get it in there before Germany, the next government is formed. And then in Berlin, they're worried, oh, the Commission, they're going to mm -hmm. start, you know, um, conspiring uh, policies, uh, you know, devising policies that we don't actually want. Um, sorry, the, the slight <coughs> standard, but these, these, um, these um, two questions about Germany, I think, are, are quite crucial, and we'll see the next government coalition will actually you know, be quite important in shaping that. <coughs> uh, not on this particular question. Um, I was just, I, I, can, I can just add that I have, I have just, just snuck a peek at the news and indeed, as Rosa said, they have to spend the time quarreling over migration. Right. Um, <laughs> and indeed, the Tusk's uh, proposal to, to remove the, the ineffective uh, and divisive refugee quota uh, has in fact been, been quarreled over. Um, and, th and that's something that, that it is ineffective. And again, that was, it was done without, without buy-in from the individuals themselves because they're not being forced to relocate, they're being asked that they want to relocate. And, and so many of them are choosing not to do so. So there are, there are sort of on both ends of the spectrum, there, there are people uh, pushing back uh, against that. Um, and that's something that, that I, th I think rather the point, I, th I think he's right to, to stop uh, insisting on relocation right now because it's not going to to go and so then we need to look at why it's not and what, certainly one of the questions is uh, anti-immigration and once again the, the report in the Guardian was saying there were refugees which I slipped up a couple times on as well but they're asylum seekers and this is a question of people who whose claims would then be processed by the relevant countries and again as long as you have vastly different recognition rates in different countries then that's something that also is, is nonsensical. So there are other issues that need to be addressed first before you can start looking at, at, at relocation, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, yeah, maybe the only thing that I would say among the economic, I mean, is, is the German, uh, the German issue. Uh, obviously, Germany is the largest country in the EU, is the largest country in the Euro area, mm -hmm. and has been the, uh, the anchor uh, of the Euro area. Uh, I mean, there are many things to, to, to be said about uh, Germany. Uh, one is that, I mean, I'm talking as an economist, um, it is a fact, and you know, we all know this, it is a fact that, uh, and I don't know whether I would put that on the insular, mm. uh, I don't know that I, I would use the insular label, mm. but one could, but I don't think that would be the mm. right way to, mm. to, to, to put it. It's true that the crisis, mm. different reading, of the causes of the crisis and how to deal with the crisis mm -hmm. than generally economists in other yeah. Euro area countries. I'm not even talking about the US yeah. and the UK, but okay. talking even yeah. within the Euro area. Mm -hmm. And that is clearly a, 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 a difficulty. So, I mean, there it's inside the Euro area, um, there are different, there are mm -hmm. different viewpoints. And uh, it has taken quite a while, I think we are doing better now, but it has taken quite a while to have some degree of convergence mm. of analysis. Mm. And obviously politicians, they do listen to uh, their advisors, including the economic advisors, <laughs> and they're, they're influenced by that. Uh, the second point that I, I, I would make is that um, when one looks from, from the viewpoint of France and from Macron, mm -hmm. one has to feel for him, obviously, because it's clear that the whole plan was, and he was very explicit in the campaign, again, I'm, I'm, I'm sticking to the, to, to, the, to the euro, is that, okay, he said many times in the campaign, you know, France had, uh, has uh, homework to do, and uh, before we are credible at the table, at the euro area uh, table, especially with, uh, with Germany, the number of internal reforms that we need to, to make, and then we will be a credible partner to, together with Germany and others, but mainly with Germany, to reform the, uh, the, uh, the, the Eurozone. So I think for, for France, I mean, and, and, and the, 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 the Macron uh, uh, presidency has put forward you know, not just ideas, but also reforms in France, they must have been very disappointed, mm -hmm. or he must have been very disappointed of the result of the, uh, of the German elections mm -hmm. and of the, the situation now. <coughs> because yeah. I, 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 mean, I think those, I mean, those are very naive views. I mean, those who think that, you know, know that uh, Mrs. Merkel is weak, Macron is going to mm -hmm. be the leader of Europe or the Euro. I don't think that uh, Macron has any, uh, has any illusion of that. I mean, what he would have liked, obviously, is to have a strong chancellor and France to be a strong 
companion to a strong uh, to a strong Germany. To, so to have a weak Germany here in in this. So I I mean what what does strike me is that regardless of what outcome they will be uh, mm -hmm. of the uh, situation, uh, what kind of government we are going to have, I think it's clear that those who did well, the parties that did well in the election, are not the parties that are for huge leap forward <coughs> in the governance uh, of the euro area. And that's the reason why in my presentation also I put the emphasis on the crisis mechanism. Because I think this is, you know, to come with the big ideas, including the fiscal ideas, I think uh, is, uh, is just too, there's too much of a hurdle at the moment to have even that kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, uh, focus on what is really the most important issues, and uh, which I think is, is the crisis management, and where I think our German colleagues can at least uh, you know move forward on, on that. Um, I'm going to be unkind, and we should draw to a close, shouldn't we? And I'm really sorry because I know their hands going up. I think some wine is meant to appear, <laughs> and that over the wine and the canopies, there'll be opportunities to talk to our panelists on a one-on-one -on -one informal basis. Will you join me, however, first? I really want to thank our four panellists who have been wonderful and have covered a wonderful range, but have also kind of dovetailed nicely and intersected with each other in ways that one couldn't necessarily have expected. So I'm very pleased about that. One thing that I think is very striking, and everybody talked about in one way or another, there's some real issues about political communication. Mm -hmm. You talked about caricatures. Mm -hmm. I would use the word narratives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how do we... How do they, whoever the actors are, develop narratives in order to support the kinds of investments in public policy initiatives that all of you mm. have been talking about? Anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.